Hello, listeners of the Line Podcast for this recording on April 26, 2024 with your hosts, Jen Gerson, myself, and Matt Gurney. We've got so much to talk about today. This week, Pierre Polyev visits the baddies and the predictable Twitter outrage ensues. We're going to ask what the hell is going on at the CBC again, and we're going to get into a little bit of the latest crazy in Alberta this week at the Line Podcast. Well, we got a lot to talk about. Um, shout out everybody who came out to see us in Calgary. That was a lot of fun. Uh, that was an absolute blast. And thank you to uh, a special thank you to uh, DNS Advocates, our lawyers who sponsored the event. And also a special thank you to Ken Bozenkul. Uh He gave us some logistical support that helped us uh, pull off that event as well. We're, we're very grateful uh, to him for that. And if you had fun in Calgary, or if you were sad you couldn't make it to our event in Calgary, maybe you can make it to Edmonton. We have just announced uh, last night at the time of this recording that our next in-person event is coming up in Alberta's capital city. That's coming up on June 6th. So that's about six weeks. Call it away. Uh, Jen, this is going to be a lot of fun. You've done the heavy lifting on this event, um, which I'm, and by the way, you did the heavy lifting on Calgary too. Like you're, you're taking charge of your own backyard, so to speak. You did a great job. Tell everybody just uh, in a couple of seconds here, what do we have coming up in Edmonton uh, in about six weeks? Sure. So the line is co-hosting this event called Is Canada Prepared for the Next Shitstorm? Uh, please don't bleep me out. Uh, we're co-hosting this event with the Max uh, Bell School of Public Policy, and we are going to have, a, it's going to be a panel discussion with uh, Lisa Raitt, with Trevor Toome, and also with uh, economist Chris Reagan. We're going to ask ourselves how economically prepared Canada is for the absolutely inevitable disaster that is to come, given that we are in the darkest of all dark timelines, whether that disaster be pandemic, war, economic collapse, Bitcoin takeover, who the hell knows? So we're going to be discussing all those kinds of economic potential potential potentialities. And also, this is going to be part of a broader speaker series that the line is doing that we hope will uh, coalesce into a kind of mini manifesto to help guide a future government in making significant reforms to Canada to get us out of the the shitter that we are currently in. So um, I think it's going to be a really interesting event. It's going to be 40 bucks, but with that, you're also getting drinks and you're getting uh, some some delicious uh, appetizers as well, a really entertaining and fun night out, little chat and, and meet and greet with the event's um, co-host and moderator, you and me, and uh, some, some, some chat time. So it's going to be a lot of fun. If you are going to be in Edmonton for June 6th, do consider checking it out. I think it's going to be a blast. Our last event was a blast. This event is also going to be a blast. I've been assured that no one parties like Edmonton people party. So uh, looking looking forward to that. Uh, no, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's been too long since I've been in Edmonton. So in about six weeks, I'll be back out with you, Western Canada. You, you'll make a Westerner of me yet. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. You won't. Um, snob. Want me, Trump want me to take snob. Lead on, um, yeah, let's yeah. talk about let's talk about Pierre and his little uh, 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 yeah. his little spontaneous spot, his spontaneous little uh, drop in to a protest in Nova Scotia. Matt, tell us all about that. So this is one of those stories, Jen, and there's versions of this uh, that pop up time to time in my line of work. Uh, and I want to mention just purely break the fourth wall just for a second. You and I are very busy right now. There's a lot going on uh, behind the scenes of the line. And, and a big part of it is the fact that we just, just what we announced, like at the Edmonton event, like there's been a lot of last minute planning going on for that. So this week has been a real scramble, I think, for us both. Mm -hmm. And a couple of days ago, um, I started getting messages going, Pierre, P Pierre did what? P what, what, what did Pierre do? And I'm looking, I'm like, I don't know, like I'm, I'm on a Zoom, like leave me alone. But what he ended up doing was part of an Atlantic Canadian tour. Pierre Polyev visited a protest site um, on the, uh, the Nova Scotia, New Brunswick border and posed for photos and uh, chatted with the people at the, the protest site and made some remarks, which were caught on film, and then he left. And this sounds very banal. And well, especially then we should know quickly, that the protest site was like a, an ongoing kind of blockade of kinds to protest yeah. the carbon tax. Yeah, it's an encampment. It's, right. I don't think they blocked any roads, oh, but it's enough. like it road, road okay. encampment with trailers. Okay. And uh, driving by, the opposition leader jumped out. Now, I, I've put a very banal description on it. And then what ended up happening is that very quickly, um, it was noted by people who watched the videos and uh, had some familiarity with the people. 
some of the people at this encampment site, and look, there's no term I'm going to use here that is not going to get me uh, my balls busted either by the left or the right. But some of these people are on the political extreme in Canada. Um, some of them are apparently affiliated with the so-called uh, Diagalon. Uh, is that right? Diagalon, something like that. Diagalon yeah. movement. Uh, others are just sort of more sovereign citizen style, uh, reject the authority of, of government types. And the fun thing about this, before we get into the political analysis of this, is that I had said to you in a text message, I guess, whenever, whenever the day this broke is, I can tell you immediately the exact people in this country by name who are going to say, isn't it great to see the opposition leader reaching out to politically disaffected people? And I can also tell you the exact same people in this country by name who are going to go, Pierre Polyev might as well have just showed up in a Gestapo uniform, goose-stepped around the New Brunswick legislature for a while, flipped everybody off, and then gone home. Mm -hmm. And the honest answer, and I immediately, t uh, as soon as, as soon as like I, first, well, first of all, I sighed heavily. And I was like, oh, God, so I'm going to have to spend some time chasing this down this week. I immediately got on the phone with some Conservative Party uh, sources, including some who are in the Polyev inner circle. And my polite question to them was, hey, it's your buddy, Matt. What the fuck? And, uh, you know, a couple of them tried to play coy for a while. Well, what do you mean? And I'm like, look, I, I laid out three options. I said, tell me if it's one, two or three. Step one political outreach because you want to firm up your right-wing vote flank. Step two, Pierre Polyev has decided to come out as a fascist. Step three, he's trolling people where he knew exactly what he was doing. He And he's doing it because he's got a 20-point lead and he doesn't care if a segment of Twitter gets angry at him. And he's willing to piss people off because it amuses him. There's an option four in that. Well, and then I was told that it's option four fuck up <laughs> where they're driving along they see some people protesting taxes and stuff and polyev who despite his current 20 point lead i think if you talk to people who have known him he is strategically smart but sometimes tactically not decided to jump out and pose for pictures and they didn't do any advanced vetting on who these people were had no idea about the symbology sketched on the side of the uh, van and then drove off. And I said to them, will there be an apology or a statement of any kind? And I was told the boss doesn't apologize. Doesn't so, admit he's wrong. Doesn't apologize. Can, can I, can I, as I said, without, I don't necessarily want to take your sources at face value because it's totally possible that they're feeding you a line, right? Like that's possible. Absolutely. But if, everybody lies to me all the time. Everybody it's lies. To you. We, we have to assume that as a possibility and that, in fact, this this was uh, uh, some kind of attempt to firm up this aspect of the conservative base in, in, in as much as it is an aspect of the conservative base. Do I think that do, do I confess that I think that option four is the most probable? And the reason why I think option four is the most probable just has to do with the way that what Pierre was saying on the tape that I saw and his behavior on the tape that I saw. I think that just what happened is, of course, we know that the conservatives have gone on hard on an axe, the carbon tax plank. He saw a bunch of uh, people on the side of the road, his political hard working, Canadian hard working Canadian people on the side of the road protesting the carbon thing. And he just saw this as an opportunity to 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 essentially um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, glad hand and Politics. politic. Yeah, because that's what he does. It's all he knows. It's his kind of his instinct. It's his it's his his it's metier. So he pulls over. He does the, the the handstand. Nobody thinks twice about it. Nobody thinks to vet it. Nobody even really even. And also, also the other thing I would say is like a lot of the diagonal and stuff. I think that people on the left in this country are oftentimes much more aware of the radicalism on the right than people on the right are. Just as I think a lot of people on the right are much more aware or or sensitive to the extremism on the left. We're all blind to our we're own failings. We're all blind failings. to our own failings, but I do think that we're also hypersensitized to the failings of others or to the extremism in others. I think that what... Well, we have to be distracted by the failures of others, lest True. we might have so to... So I think that also mirror. a lot of the people on the left are really, really hypersensitive to Diagalon without realizing that 
like 99% of people who are with the, actually within the conservative movement have no idea who these guys are. They don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that Pierre Polyev wouldn't have recognized Diagolon. Like I wouldn't recognize Diagolon stuff. I'm not particularly clued into that. That's not an excuse. I do think a fuck up's a fuck up. Um, and also these are instincts that Pierre is going to have to learn to um, balance more effectively because he shouldn't be hanging out with like team admiralty law, but I don't see a Pierre Polyev going into this particular encampment and being like, we're going to declare admiralty law. I see him going into this encampment and saying exactly what he says in totally mainstream rallies, which is we're going to ax the tax. Nobody likes the tax. <laughs> you know, so um, I, I, the idea that he thinks that this is a this is a significant base of the conservative party that needs to be shored up or placated, that doesn't ring quite true to me. Just based on his own his own video, this strikes, but it just does strike me as as a fuck up of a more ordinary nature. Uh, of the, th I mean, I offered them three possible explanations and. They gave me the fourth, which is no fuck up. Didn't know what we were doing. Walked into it. Didn't do the research. Uh, people on the campaign didn't have the leader under control. Okay. It's not great. It's not great. But it's plausible. But it, plausible. Uh, if it's if it's not that explanation, I vote option three. Deliberate troll. Deliberate eh? troll. And, and you and I have talked about this before. Uh, we talked about this during mm -hmm. the Big Tau stuff. Uh, we talked about it um, around, oh, sorry, for, for listeners who have no idea what I was just talking about, someone analyzed the social media tags uh, in Pierre Polyev's videos and found tags, which are designed to basically trigger search algorithms. And I know I'm trying to explain this in an accessible way and I'm making it worse, but basically you can bury data inside um, a, a digital, a social media post, like a photo or a movie that isn't visible to the public, but helps search engines like Google find it and some of the tags that were being plugged into pierre polyev's material were Incel affiliated culture. with weird yeah. dark yeah weird dark internet subculture i thought that that, that was a total great. nothing burger of a story because it sounded to me like somebody had just copied and pasted a whole like a hundred two hundred tags that were generally affiliated with conservative stuff that's exactly and they just and they were I just constantly putting the same tags in into the into the the tag fields as as a matter of course. I don't think anybody. I don't think there was conscious thought behind that. I, I think everybody went yeah, to Joe right. Rogan and um, uh, uh, Ben Shapiro's YouTube videos because yeah. they're very successful. Copied all their tags right. and copied them into Pierre's. But if it's not that explanation, I think someone did it to go. <laughs> and then I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. That's too so obscure. Angry. This is the, the, the most obvious answer for some of this. The people doing this kind of coding are real. I don't know, Matt, obscure. that's, that's that even that strikes me as a bit of a stretch. I, I honestly think that it's just, it's just more simple than that. They just had like a, t a bunch, couple of hundred tags in a Google doc somewhere that they knew were generally affiliated with conservative videos. And they were just put, putting it all, you know, all in the same metadata data. Oh. I, that's I, my first bet. My second bet Maybe. is troll. And I've been writing for years that most of the political parties, including the conservatives, are being run by the social media. That's a teams. problem. I think you're right. I think that instinct is a problem. Yeah. I said, I so said, anyway, my, 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 yeah. my uh, conclusion is that there was an, there was an element of a couple of different failures from Pierre Polyev's own, uh, as I said, his own, his own kind of political metier, his desire to glad hand, his desire to do the hustings walk. I think he likes doing that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that, uh, it, there was also maybe an element of, of trolliness. I'm going to, I'm going to engage in some of that. So yeah, I think the trolling, a degree, a degree of trolling this strikes, strikes, strikes me as, it strikes me as plausible, but right? perhaps not necessarily understanding the fire that he was playing with, with that troll. Um, which again is going to be, I think a criticism that. Look, he met the convoy. Like the guy has a record of being like, whatever's going to yeah. piss the CBC. Yeah. At, at I'm going to do panel off. I'm going to do. And, and, I'm never and, gonna and also, once again, I think this and, is a criticism we're going to come back to again and again with Pierre is that y you don't necessarily fully understand the fire that you're playing with. Um, you know, it's one thing to go hang out with the sovereign citizens crowd. It's another thing to govern that crowd. Best of luck with that. Because that's what you're going to have to wind up doing, and those people, when they start to realize that you know you you are not going to 
abolish the Canadian state and reinstitute, reinstitute admiralty law, they're going to turn on you because they're going to see you as the exact same expression of power and authority that they're railing against today. Once somebody has lost, um, once somebody has lost uh, faith in the state to govern them, they, they don't come back from that. That's, that's gone. They're not going to change their mind when you're the governors. I, I just don't think that that is, that is something that this current conservative movement necessarily respects or understands. So I said, I think that that's something that we can put a pin in that because I think this is going to be an ongoing and recurring theme in our criticism of Pierre Polyev. But I do want to know, uh, transition a little bit because the liberal reaction to it. Can, can, hmm, before yeah. we do, I just want to mention one thing. Can I just mention one thing? One of the things that jumped out about this me, and I, I did tell my conservative friends this when I was buzzing them this week to ask them WTF. I said to them, guys, look, I know the boss leans into this kind of thing. I know he doesn't like to admit error. I know he doesn't like to apologize. That's human. And maybe it's a little more amped up in politicians and than the rest of us, but it's human. I get it. But I also said, I don't, I told them straight up and this is going to piss people off. It's going to piss everybody off. This is going to be one of those real unifying moments here. Cause I'm going to piss everybody off simultaneously that. to the people who are, <laughs> I do. To the people who are really pissed off about this, who are convinced that this is Pierre Polyev showing up with a red not, uh, swastika armband, not a no. single vote is going to move no. because of this. The outrage of this is limited in the pre-existing echo chambers. The people, everyone who has an opinion of Pierre Polyev already is going to have this, is going to reinforce it. No one, not a single mind in this country is going to change. This is an extremely online story. Game. And as I said, that's that's exactly it. Most people aren't going to care. But I did tell my conservative friends, you know, we're a couple of days into this story and the PM is you know lamenting it. And, and the, the usual suspects on social media are declaring the second coming of Adolf Hitler and, and, and so on and so forth. But what I did say to my friends is that sooner or later, the boss is going to fuck up yeah. in a way he can't ignore. And. And this is not even a Pierre Polyev specific comment, although I think it, I think it applies to him. But the comment is more broad, and the comment is that every politician needs to be controlled. Mm -hmm. There has got to be someone in their immediate loop who says to them, "No, we have an event in the next town. We're not pulling off at the fucking roadside encampment so you can glad hand." And that is part of keeping a politician on schedule. But it is also keeping them out of areas that have not been vetted, people who have not been vetted. This is all part of the modern political arrangement. And earlier this week, I wrote a column about Krista Freeland and some of the comments she had made um, uh, in reference to the, uh, the really nasty anti-Semitic uh, incidents in Ottawa last weekend. And one of the things I mentioned right at the part of the column, because it wasn't really the part I thought was most interesting, but I wanted to mention it right away, is that Freeland had said when she went out, I think it was on Monday or Tuesday, I think it was Monday, she said, I hadn't seen the comments in Ottawa. If the deputy prime minister of the country is doing a media availability in a city, Montreal, with a large Jewish population, on the eve of Passover, after an incident of, of overt anti-Semitism in the national capital, and Krista Freeland has not seen those comments yet. That is unfucking believable political yeah. negligence by her staff. Someone should be fired into the sun for that. And whoever was in the van and didn't tell Polyev, no, we're not pulling over at the weirdo encampment. Yeah, because I think to some extent, to, 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 and also to some extent, politicians kind of need to be safe from their own worst instincts half the time. I, I think that that is that's just a they're, they're, they're in a bubble, in a bubble. and also. Well, and all people think we're in a bubble. I don't have yeah, thirty yeah. staffers going well, around. Yeah, and not only that, but bluntly, it's 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 people who p politicians are weird. The sort of people who are compelled to run for politics are weirdos. They're, they're, you're not. Well, we we're normal. We're normal normal normal. than them, man. Like uh, you don't see me signing up for that job, and for good reason. Uh, that job's hell. So, like the sort of people who are compelled to do that kind of job are not are not normies, yeah. man. So you, you do need to have. Um, people around them who are a little bit more normal and grounded. Well, no, are but we I mean, I've made this argument about Justin Trudeau. How much better would the prime minister's office be right now if they hired some random retired uh, farmer from Saskatchewan to just hang out with them, just be like with a trucker hat? Right, nah, right, you know, guys, I don't that, think you've yeah. thought this through. Look, like, Jane, you know what I mean? Like the entire prime minister's office would, would for the last three years would have been well served to, to get some like 
rando dude who is just completely normal, salt of the earth, typical voter, you know, um, a working class person in their prime minister's office just to just to bounce ideas off of, you know, and, and, and none of these politicians do that. They never surround themselves with people who challenge them. Uh, and, and it's it's and I and it leads to bad instincts and bad political decisions every time. But anyway, I do want to transition to the next thing because I want to talk about how the liberals have responded to this drama. And I'm going to quote this from um, Justin Trudeau directly. Justin Trudeau says, quote, well, well, first, there is one thing we have to do first, yeah. though, Jen, just for tradition's sake. Like and subscribe the line because like we're, we're the less weird weirdos. Um, anyway, I want to quote, get this quote from Justin Trudeau in his response to all of this, and that is, quote, because that's what exactly what Pierre Polyev continues to do, not just when you see him engaging with members of Diagonal, but also when he refuses to condemn and reject the endorsement of Alex Jones. For those who have not been following, Alex Jones put out a tweet this week that said something to the effect of Pierre Polyev is the real deal. He's, he's saying everything that I agree with. Alex Jones is probably best known for being the guy who had to pay out what a billion dollars in libel settlements because he said that the parents of uh, who had lost children in the Sandy Hook massacre were crisis actors. It he said it was fake. fake. Yeah. And therefore the fake. parents who had already lost their children in a horrible shooting accident uh, were hounded for years and years and years by Alex Jones's followers and people claiming they were part of some kind of government conspiracy to fake a massacre so that uh, the government would take away their yeah. guns. So, I think it's worth just taking 10 seconds here. Crisis actors is a term that floats around on social media that used broadly means that a lot of the events that are are in the news have been staged and the crisis actors are the people who show up and portray the traumatized crowd, the grieving widow, the uh, parents whose child has been killed. Apparently, according to the conspiracy, these things are being faked to advance a government agenda. So when you know, when we use the term crisis actors, what he was accusing these parents of is basically being on the government payroll to portray grieving parents. Yeah, so and I mean, if, if, if you guns. believe that, um, I would say that your attachment to consensus reality is so far gone that you should probably turn off this podcast now. Um, you were, you're not going to get what you're looking for from us here. We've already mentioned Alex Jones, Jen. You know full well yeah, they're going to be true. in the comments. Fair enough. Um, anyway... Look, uh, do I think it reflects well on Pierre Polyev that Alex Jones is endorsing him? No, I don't. Do I think that uh, Polyev should respond to that in any way? Also, no, I don't. There's just nothing else to add. And then the other thing I would note to all of that is, so far the federal liberals have attempted to portray Polyev as as an extremist. Whether or not you think he's an extremist or not aside, this portrayal has not worked. The more they attempt to portray him as an extremist, the higher his polling approval gets. So we warned him, Jen. We told him that the more they try to portray him as an extremist, the more he'll show up at events, even weird diagonal encampments or whatever it is. And he'll go, hey, let's ax the tax and build more houses. The more they try to link this guy to Donald Trump the better Polyev is going to look. And I'm not saying this as a Polyev endorsement. I'm saying this to a, as a warning to my progressive friends. You 100%. are legitimizing him. Yep. You don't yep. think you are, um, but you are. The other thing that I would note is that by the lack of message discipline that the liberals consistently display on this stuff, they're like magpies. It's like, shiny thing, shiny thing. He did something crazy. Let's go for it. You know what we stopped talking about the second that – Prime Minister started talking about Diagalon at Diagalon, which is again a group that most people have never heard of, and Alex Jones. We stopped talking about the budget. Like this budget was supposed to be their big strategic comeback budget where they were going to put all in on housing and they were going to start to turn things around and they were going to get the youngs back. And literally that lasted what, four or five days before you lost message discipline because you couldn't help yourself. What what like what am I what am I missing? I think, well, I don't think you're missing anything, but I think I would, I think it's two things. One of them is that I think to your exact point, the budget didn't the work. The budget didn't work. And the two weeks of pre-budget spending announcements didn't work. And I'm patient. You know, I'm, I, I've been doing this job a while now. I had hair when I started, you know, I'm very patient about this to totally get a refreshed polling mm-hmm. average slate. You need two or three weeks. 
uh, because some polls, uh, you need four or five days to do them and then they need to be processed and then they're published. Every poll is capturing, hey, look, you can rush a poll and get a pretty quick reaction to a breaking news issue. But in general, polls are a snapshot of how people felt a few days ago, maybe a week. And you get a couple of weeks of those in, and then all the polls that came out before the budget will be washed out of the rolling averages the aggregators use. So in two two weeks after a budget, you get a pretty good sense of how it's landing. We're not there yet. We're a week and a half away. Well, the other, the other thing the I would note in all that that's, um, inter- that's, it, that's interesting to me is not only has the, so, the budget not led to the bump or the return, which by the way, would, was a really weird thing to bet on because budgets almost never do that. Budgets almost never lead to turn around fortunes or bumps well, or anything of the kind. Well, well I guess what else yeah, did you have? Yeah. The point, right? Like you asked me, why are they, this is probably the why object. they're down by 20. They have like, they've been in a spiral in a for two years now. Slump since. Well, why? Anyway, the other thing that I thought was interesting so, is that we have seen uh, a word that, that we have Justin Trudeau, he's going to try and fight back and we should expect Justin Trudeau to be showing up on more podcasts. We're waiting for our, our, our invitation to interview you, Mr. Trudeau. You are welcome to on the line at any moment. We would be happy to have you. However, I would note that it seems really um, counterintuitive to me, if you were a liberal, to think that the problem is too, too little Trudeau. That the answer is that really you just need to get Trudeau out there going on podcasts like he did this week on a Vox podcast saying things like, quote, all those things is why life is difficult right now. And the actual fact is, particularly when you compare us to other countries around the world, all those things have made life better in meaningful ways. And it would be much worse if we hadn't done those things. Justin Trudeau's approach to um, fighting here to making himself more available and more in front of people's faces is having, I think, a counter... It's not having a positive bump effect. It's having a negative bump effect. The more he does these things, the more unpopular he gets. And part of that is because he's trying to do two things at once. He's trying to pivot against his own record, saying housing, immigration, all these sorts of things, everything's in the tank. I agree. It's shitty. But at the same time, taking no accountability for that record at the same time. Oh, and it's actually it's it's actually things aren't shitty at the same time. It's just that you've been misled. You've been you've you you are getting um, sidetracked by disinformation. Actually, things are great now. It's a really confusing mixed message. It's not it's not doing the right things, and as a result, it just comes across as tone deaf and bizarre. And I think it's actually contributing to his lack of popularity. So if he's going to continue to do podcast shows, all of these sorts of things, he needs to pick a lane. Either Canada's broken and he broke it and he's going to fix it, or Canada's not broken, it's been doing great, and you should all just be thankful that that he's been in office for this length of time because the conservatives would make it so much worse. You can do one lane or you can do the other lane. You can't do both lanes simultaneously. It's 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 confused messaging. They're sure as hell going to try. I mean, I kind of respect it. But as I said, I'm quite serious. Right. If, if Justin Trudeau wants to come on the line podcast, we'd be happy to have him. I think, uh, yeah, no, we, we'd be delighted to have him on the line. Um, two things I'll say in response to that. First, um, I I might be increasingly in the minority on this one, but I still think Justin Trudeau is the Liberals' best bet in the 2000s. They're increasingly the running election. out of runway to and, replace him. And, and the reason I that, I also think he has a unique ability to win votes in, in the, the GTA in Montreal that any of his replacements will trade one for the other. And I also think to your point, he's a known quantity and anyone else might not have the time to get up to speed here. Um, to be clear, I'm not saying he's going to win that the That would be quite election, the bet. You'd be taking quite the odds on that one. In fact, I almost kind of encourage you to do it just because the odds are so out, out of whack. The liberal, you know what, tell you what, if one of our, if one of our many fans out there would like to donate $100 to the line and put in the donation field for the bet, I will go bet. That money, I will wager with someone else's money that Justin Trudeau wins. Yeah, but a a ten to one odds, and then you'll and then you'll cash the thousand dollar check. I will share the winnings with whoever spots. I'm willing to bet that no one is going to take that offer up. No, I don't think we're going to see that either. Um, But I, so I still think I understand the position the Liberals are in strategically. If they are going to make the choice that Trudeau is the guy to stay with, if only to hold off maybe a total collapse, and maybe that's their best case scenario. Maybe their best case scenario is, look, he he saves the furniture in the GTA and Greater Montreal, and we have 60, 70, 80 seats to rebuild around as, as a really effective opposition. Whereas you take a bet on one or the other, 
you end up having some yeah. weird Kim Campbell thing happen and you end up with like 30 seats. So that's a possibility. Uh, the other thing I, I wanted to say, though, about and it's more about the shiny objectism that you were talking about before. I want to underline this, and it's easy to say, but I think it's important to understand. Do not do not underestimate the degree to which liberals hate Pierre Paul. Yes, there's just not enough of them anymore. No, but I think in terms of, like you said, like the, the reaction, like why did they move off the budget? Because mm. liberals hate Pierre Polyev in much the same way that I've been warning conservatives mm. for years. You hate yeah, Justin Trudeau you. too much. You aren't willing to take a look at the, the broader issues here. And I also think conservatives have con continually mm -hmm. underestimated Justin yep. Trudeau because they hate him so much. There are a lot of conservatives out there who have no good explanation other than the CBC did it, why they keep losing to a yeah. stupid drama teacher. They can't recognize that this guy's a fighter and he's effective in politics. Right now, liberals are making mm. that same mistake. And I think I tell people this. You have to understand, I don't hate the people you hate as much as you. I hate my own people for my own reasons. Don't worry. Like, I, I let the hate flow through me. But if you really, really, you really see, hate someone. You can't someone, see the problem clearly anymore. You you're, you're, hate, 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 will hate right. blinds your analytical capacities. Actually, this is something that's an interesting it's an, why, why it's, it's an interesting thing because I think love everybody. one thing that you We're and I both do is we really cultivate a degree of emotional detachment, which makes us seem a little cyborgish to a lot of ordinary people. And I think a lot of partisans project their own emotional schemas onto us. They assume that because they're emotionally attached to this person or they hate this person, they like this person, that therefore we must be doing the same. We must also hate these people. I keep on trying to make this point and people don't believe me, but it's true. I don't dislike any of these people. I disagree with them sometimes. Or dislike them all. Dislike That's a different quote. I don't have strong emotional reactions to any of these people. Um, I'm sure I could have drinks with any of them. I might disagree with certain policies they do, or they might annoy me sometimes, but I've cultivated a degree of emotional detachment from them because I know that the second you start hating these people, your capacity to see clearly, see their appeals, see their downsides, see their weaknesses and their strengths just warps. It just warps dramatically. And I think that when I've made mistakes as a journalist, it's because it's been, I've, my, I've allowed my emotions to get the better of my brains, which is why I try and it's why I try to maintain Someone, when I do uh, get angry about things, I try to get angry about things like pa plastic bags and not people. <laughs> like that's a good, that's a good channel for emotional rage. Someone, someone said something to me recently, it was a few weeks ago, it was mm -hmm. meant as a compliment, but I thought it was funny person said to me, and I won't, I won't even tell you what the issue is. They said to me, I agree with almost everything you write because you're very fair. You, they said to me, Matt, you're very fair. You approach everything with an open mind. You you get the evidence. You make a, a persuasive, logical, fact-based argument. With the exception of this issue, you're just totally blinded by your emotion on this issue. I went, okay. I said, is it possible? I said, how, I said, how invested are you mm -hmm. in that issue? They're like, oh, really invested. And I'm like, so do you think it's possible that I'm actually this one, but you're just you're just projecting your emotional board? Like, yeah, you're sensitive on this issue. Well, that, and that's and, and, no. I, and I don't want to say that we're we're like, immune to that. It's not like like I think we try to cultivate a degree of detachment, but we don't always succeed. But we fail. We fail sometimes well, we for fail sure. Sometimes. So I don't want to say be like a superior being here. We're not. But I do think that we both understand that we serve a role in an ecosystem, and that role is does require us to to put some work into not getting emotionally invested either positively or negatively in individuals. Right. And I, can I say something to you that I think will surprise you mm -hmm. or the listeners, maybe you'll get it. I have come to like Justin mm. Trudeau more over the years, not in a political mm -hmm. sense. He's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote for him. Not my kind of politician, but I've seen him handle some situations with a yeah. degree of, I would say grace, including yeah. his recent family troubles. And, I don't, I don't feel a lot of kinship with any of these people. Mm -hmm. I think they're all weirdos. But as, as a husband, you can as connect a father, with him. I wouldn't want to go through. You can empathize. You can empathize with him. You in, can empathize on, on a global stage, and that that humanized him to me. And I also think his instincts in the pandemic, with some very notable exceptions, mm. were largely right. And I think, and I can say this without endorsing a single one of his policies, I can make this comment neutrally. The guy has had nothing but historic curveballs thrown at him for the last five years. 
I can't think of another prime minister outside of the world wars who has had to deal with more wild bullshit outside of his control then so thanks for that matt, matt because Trudeau. as a result of that diatribe which was very thoughtful and 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 sincere we're going to get all kinds of down likes good, good i very much expect to be ratioed so um but Still not voting for the guy. but i think that you i think i think i think i think I you have i think you world. have made the I pitch for him to appear on on the line uh, to be interviewed and he will get a fair a fair trial and a fair hearing and on that note do like and as owned as as owned and subsidized yes. government journalists obviously <laughs> on knows that note find out. like and do we, we don't take government don't money take like government and subscribe money. the line like um matt subscribe. do you want to talk about your twitter thread on protests or shall we uh move on to the other subjects because we've been going on for some time now um yeah i mean i can talk about it briefly just because i feel like yeah. we've kind of covered some of the ground already um so I mentioned already, I, and I, it was it was a big part of that Christian Freeland column I wrote. Things got really ugly in Ottawa mm -hmm. uh, last weekend, so about six days ago when we're recording this. Um, so I'm overt anti-Semitism in in the protests there, and I've also been keeping an eye. I hate watching campus politics. I fucking yeah. hate campus politics. Like, you want to know what you do with the Shoot students them. who are troublesome no. today? You wait four years. Okay, but I mean, I, I, I made that argument like, 10 years ago, yeah. and then all of a sudden campus politics became newsroom politics, and campus politics became HR politics and corporate politics. Like, you can you can make that point right up until the point that you can't make that point anymore. I still think you can make the point. I think the failure was not of the students. Well, that, that is clear. That's why we started the... <laughs> but anyway, look... I've been look. I've been looking. Yeah, I don't think the nature of the problem posed by mm. the students changed. I think the nature of the institutions and their and willingness the self, to the, say the no, self respect that's stupid, of the institutions that corroded and collapsed. Yeah, we did I it to ourselves. Right. On a, like that should be our civilizational yeah, engraved on ourselves. our civilizational tombstone. We did it to ourselves. But I the, making the point about the protests, which is simply that I understand that a lot of people out there are horrified yeah. by what's happening in Gaza. I get it. And I know I don't get the, and I know people don't think I get it, but I get it. And I know that there's a lot of people out there who are uh, genuinely morally horrified, or they've also spent probably about 45 seconds in their entire life thinking about the issue. And then they go order a Palestinian flag on Amazon and show up at a march. I get it. Youth is stupid. And I say this as a reformed, former stupid I mean, young person. Which is another word of saying old I'm sure person. You Increasingly, yeah. Um, but I also think that there is an element within these protests that is overt, hard, anti-Semitic. Traditional, old school, blood libel, Jew hatred. And I think too many people are bending over backwards to give these people political cover because when they see these protests, all they see are the nice, if maybe somewhat misguided, white kids waving Palestinian flags. Or that they they, they sincerely and they're um, not connect willing... to the, the, the cause of, of, of Palestine. They're not willing to take the violence and the calls for violence seriously. Because we don't like... We, we talked about this earlier, Jen. We're mm -hmm. all blind to our own problems. And it reminded me of when I went to Ottawa in 2022 to cover the convoy, how much time I spent trying to tell people that this is not one monolithic movement, that you've got a, a lot of nice, maybe misguided people here who are very frustrated by either genuine government overreach or at least arguably genuine government overreach with pandemic health measures. Or as I wrote at the time, they believe a lot of batshit crazy things. But they're not bad. They're not evil. They're not here to hurt anyone. But you've also got a real nasty hard edge embedded in that crowd. And I think when it was when left wing people looked at the convoy, all they saw mm -hmm. was the Confederate flag. When left wing people see look at the Palestinian protests, all they see are the nice students protesting against the bombing of a food convoy. And on the right. Okay, it so is can I play devil's advocate reversed. with that particular Twitter thread a little bit? Um oh, I think that I, I think. Yeah. Anyway, and to your point, yeah, you're I, 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 and, and I think it was interesting to watch the response to that because I think the point you were trying to make 
and did make was you have to be able to call out your own side when you see bullshit. And I think that that is a, 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 a very perennial and very reasonable position. What I think, how I think people are hearing that and responding to it was that you were driving, drawing a moral equivalence between the trucker convoy and the Palestinian marches. And I'm not, and to play devil's advocate, I'm not sure that that moral equivalence stands. The trucker convoy um, had a really wide range of people. I don't think that, I think the people who are claiming that there was no risk of violence or none are, are wrong. We saw what happened in Coots. We, in fact, mm-hmm. last week, we saw two people yeah. have now been, uh, I think, um, found guilty of, of char- they, they, they were, they were, they were found guilty um, by a jury of, of engaging in illegal behavior. We know that there were stockpiles of, 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 of weapons. Yeah, no, I mean, like these people were the, were the, the fringe of this broader movement. These were not, they, they didn't represent the majority of the movement, but there was a real risk of, of, of violence yep. among some of them there, especially in, in coots there. Um, I think your sources about the convoy during the time were concerned about a similar kind of fringe embedded in an otherwise peaceful protest in Ottawa. Um, but we didn't see that fringe uh, in evidence um, that they either they they moved on, yep. they they got bored, they didn't whatever. That wasn't the case in Coots. I think after Coots, they boogied it. Boogied. But there was some of this stuff in Coots. So the stuff there was some of this in evidence. But what I'm saying on the Palestinian side, on the pro-Palestinian protesters, is it's not the odd fringe dude. They're openly chanting, we support what happened on October 11th. And they're all joining in, man. Yep. Like So to say that there's, and it's it, it, these sorts of calls for violence, open calls for violence, are happening repeatedly, consistently, across multiple cities, across multiple protests, it's, it's again and again and again. That is not something we saw during the trucker convoy. The trucker convoy, were, there were definitely a couple of people who out in, embedded in those convoys who were a hard edge side. I, I think that that's in evidence. In these convoys, we're, or sorry, when these Palestinian protests, we're seeing, as I said, repeated consistent calls for violence and justifications of violence mm-hmm. and open anti-Semitism again and again and again and again. Does that mean that 90% of the people in these protests are really just nice people? Maybe, but there's a certain point where you got to start asking some questions here. I would also say that there's also been some evidence that some of these protests are being organized by people who are funded by certain bad actors here in ways that there, I don't, I, I did not see evidence of uh, that in the trucker convoy. Um, I know there was talk about who was funding the trucker convoy, but there was never any significant ev- evidence showing uh, terrorist involvement. There is some evidence in, 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 that's come to light and been reported about in the Palestinian pro- protests. So I'm not sure that, yes. Of terrorist finance? The, in fact, I believe uh, Tristan Hopper did some things for the National Post a couple of months ago about how some of these protests had links to, uh, I think, the Iranian guards and things like that. So uh, I'll, I'll find the source, the source and citation for that. But, you know, to, to, to draw the, these two protests and say that there's some kind of moral equivalence between the two of them, I think that that's a pretty debatable position, to be honest. I don't even think we need, look, I mean, I don't disagree with that. I think in the, the bigger difference is we don't even need to focus on moral equivalence. Yeah. The protests are very different things. The Ottawa occupation yeah. was a fixed position in a government district that was a fairly small, hard number of uh, set in static people that was joined by a broader mm. uh, transitory protest movement. It was very different protests. The Palestinian protests in Canada have mostly been short, short duration events yeah. brought in and then dispersed. Like at the end of the evening, they disperse. The mm. United States, it's a bit more different. I would be interested to learn more about who's in the encampments because one of the things you've seen some of the schools saying yeah. is these aren't our students. Well, and 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 hold like, that thought know, like, because we are so, going to have some I, reporting I, on that um, in very very short order. So I don't want to get into that yeah. in, in too great depths. You're right. I'm not sure, but these are maybe not apples to apples comparisons. Um, the 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 comparison that I want to make is that people are way too forgiving at yeah. the fanatics who agree with them. And they're and they're really quick to jump all over the fanatics that don't and define an entire movement by them. 
all I'm asking for, and I've, I've written a series of columns and the well, you know, you're not I going just want to get an that. even standard. Anyway, on that note, on that note, like and like and subscribe to the to to, to your fanatics like here at the line. Um, look, I think we've got two more things to talk about. One, I want to be fairly brief because we've already gone on quite at, at some length. One is what is happening at the CBC, and then I don't know if you want me to give a very brief rundown about Crazy in Alberta. But Matt, do you want to explain to us uh, what caught your eye at the CBC this week? I'll, I'll okay. be honest with you. I don't know what's going well, on. Well, that's going to make for a very short, um, short, and, short segment, that's now, isn't it? <laughs> Something's going on. We're not sure what. Yeah. Uh, no. Travis. Um, Travis Danraj uh, is uh, is uh, he's not a friend of mine or anything. We don't we don't know each other personally um, well at all. Uh, friendly colleague, mm-hmm. I guess. I, I would I would describe him. And uh, he a couple of uh, he, he's a CBC News television host. Uh, Canada Tonight, I think his show is called. I don't. Sorry, Travis. I should know that, but he he hosts a, a, a TV show, and he a couple of days ago had tweeted that he had asked Carrie Tate. Catherine Tate. I think her name is the uh, Tate. president. Carrie of Carrie Tate CBC. works for the Globe. Catherine Pardon Tate me? works. Is the, Catherine? There Tate. you go. Sorry, Carrie. That's right. Sorry, Carrie. My bad. Uh, Catherine Tate, um, uh, the president of the C of the CBC. He'd asked for her for an interview on the show, and she had denied it. And he tweeted that it was regrettable that she wouldn't come on and do the interview because the CBC has been a subject of recent controversies regarding budgetary priorities, bon- executive bonuses, uh, questions about journalism standards, things like that. And uh, he tweeted that his request had been denied. And then he disappeared. Hasn't been on the air. And I, I'm not, I know that a segment with him appeared on the air. And I don't know if it was pre-taped also his or not, uh, CBC pro- or sorry his uh, Twitter profile has suddenly been denuded of all CBC references. That's usually that's usually a, the sort of thing that and happens right before we get a a, a sad to announce tweet. Well, let me. In fact, I'm clicking a link right now. I also noticed that his bio page on okay. the CBC still exists. But his show page huh, so is let's, now a let's, dead let's not read too much into that. I know there's going to be some CBC Kremlinology going on there, but well, I'm just I just clicked the link on my phone right now. I want to see what happened. I just clicked the link that will take me to his show page. His bio is still there. Clicking on the show page link. Okay, Canada so let's tonight, play some devil. Yep, I want to play devil's ad. So his CBC bio exists. So let's let's, let's, let's operate on I think link. a reasonable assumption that he's either been punished, at least punished, if not fired. Let's play devil's advocate with that idea. What kind of journalist organization can expect to criticize the leader of their organization and not suffer some kind of consequences? Which one? Only one. Why is that, Matt? The CBC. What is written, written right, right into, into, into their, their mandate? mandate? And I pulled up. I pulled up a copy of the uh, the the JSP Journalism Standards and Practices. Line podcast listeners listeners will never know this, but I would like to apologize to the video viewers because I'm going to be looking off camera for a minute mm-hmm. while I read it verbatim. This is the relevant paragraph from the CBC Journalistic Standards and Practices document covering ourselves. That's the heading. Our standards do not change when the CBC or a CBC partner becomes the story. Public interest guides our choices. Although there is a potential conflict of interest, normal techniques of news gathering and decisions around the nature of coverage are the most useful way to ensure journalistic integrity. This means that that there should be clear editorial separation between those reporting on the stories and those whose priority is it to protect the interests of the corporation or its partner, This also means that reporters and editors involved in the coverage must remove themselves from insider briefings relevant to this story. So the important part of that statement, I think, is is right at the top. Our standards do not change when the CBC or a CBC partner becomes the story. If I am desperately trying to get someone to agree to an interview, or if I have offered someone an opportunity to comment and they have declined it, you are sure as shit going to see me note that publicly. I am going to tweet, comment in the article, mention on the air that I asked for an interview or asked for a um, comment. Take and was note, just take note, Justin Trudeau. Will when you deny deny us your interview on the line, fear oh, quake man. at the power of our Twitter so, following. So I would say that what 
Travis tweeted about his boss denying him an interview of... would get yeah. you in trouble. It would mm-hmm. get you in trouble at most news organizations, but it's right there in black and white. And tweeting when someone won't agree to interview, do an interview with you. So I got two observations here, and I don't want to get into this at great length because I actually have a big opus column about the CBC coming. Da, da, da. Don't worry, CBCers, you'll like it. But anyway, um, the rest of our audience might not. <laughs> but, but you know, I don't need to be popular. I'm not here to be friends. Uh, we're going to be right? so disliked the next week or two. It's going to be great. Um, but no, uh, two observations. That I, to my uh, memory, I can remember two recent interviews that Catherine Tate did with CBC reporters um, as part uh, part of trying mm-hmm. to justify the CBC, get the, the importance of the CBC out there to listeners and such. My opinion in that both of those cases, her performance was extremely poor. Um, she seemed to be coming into these, firstly, I put it, I think in many of those cases, it puts the reporter in a really awkward spot because of course the reporter has to try and maintain a degree of neutrality and tries very hard to degree, maintain a degree of neutrality and, 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 toughness with their boss. And that's really, really hard to do. I think Catherine Tate is much better served doing those kinds of interviews with um, a private media or, or independent media. Um, but she chooses not to. She chooses to do this kind of PR in-house. I think that puts the reporters in question in really tough positions. Um, but in all of, in both of these cases, I think the, the reporters um, did their jobs as well as they possibly could have in impossible circumstances. And it's clear to me from it was it was seemed from the tone to me in those performances that Tate was not expecting tough interviews and was kind of put out by the fact that the journalists were doing their job and being tough with her. Um, So it doesn't surprise me that she would uh, not want to continue with the strategy. She would not want to put herself out there for a tough interview, even among her own reporters. That doesn't surprise me. It doesn't speak well to her, but it doesn't surprise me. Um. The second thing that I would observe, and this is a little, a little, a little soup song, a little, a little t- tease ahead of the, the column that I'm trying to write, is a couple of weeks ago I talked about being at the Canada Strong and Free Network uh, conference in Ottawa. And of course, part of the reason why you go to these types of things is, is the, you know, you go to panel discussions, but the reason why you actually go to these things is to socialize afterwards. You want to hit the hospitality suites, you want to get FaceTime with people, you want to talk to people, you want to make sure they know who you are. Because especially in a, in a conference like this, you're dealing with the future power brokers of what is likely to be the next government. Um, so duh, of course you want to be there. Of course, as journalists, you want to be in the, be having drinks with these people and making sure they know who you are and chatting with them because duh. Um, the other people who realized that they needed to be in that room was, oh, just about every single lobbyist in Ottawa was making the circuits, the circuit at the CFCN conference because duh, including people who were not ideologically predisposed to conservative politics. For example, I ran into environmental lobbyists and people like this, people who, anybody who wants to have a seat at a table in a government that's likely to come to power in the next two years, knew that that's where you had to be that particular week. Yeah. It's not even a seat at the table. You need someone inside the government who will remember that they, that you, you bought them. Or even if they don't necessarily uh, agree with you or disagree with you, you want to, you, you want to make, create an actual human relationship with some of these people, right? Yeah. Yeah, correct. So and I mean, even them even sitting down, I sat down with some very interesting people and people who, who have power and who will have power. And I, the, what I frequently got back to them was, well, I read you, but I don't always agree with you. And I'm like, well, good. You shouldn't always agree with me. I expect you to not always agree with me. That is excellent. Um, but you know who I didn't see hitting any of those hospitality bars or see your circuits or any of this stuff? You know who I didn't see anywhere? Anywhere, anyone from the senior levels of the CBC. I didn't see anyone from their board. I didn't see any. I didn't see Catherine Tate. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe Catherine Tate had a better party in New York to go to that week. I mean, if your job is to try and make a case for yourself to the future conservative government, the likely future conservative government, you got to show up, gotcha. and you have to be willing to go into the, the the den of the dragon and say, "Look, here's why I think we ought to continue to exist." And you got to be willing to take that shit. None of them were willing to, sh- none of them either. They didn't know that they had to do that or they couldn't be arsed. And if I were an employee of the CBC, I'd be real, real goddamn pissed that the only one at the CFCN conference this year making a case for the CBC was Jen goddamn Gerson. 
because where were your bosses? Where were your leaders? Like I, I, the more I thought about that, the more offended I got on behalf of the many thousands of very good journalists at the CBC who work very hard to do their jobs. You you were devil's advocating me me earlier. Give give me just a measure. First of all, I do want to say I do agree. You don't have to. I do agree with what you said there. No, I do. I do. But the problem is, I think as you noted about Justin Trudeau, the more he's trying to fight back, it is very possible he ends up digging himself a bigger hole. Given what we have seen from CBC management and senior executive leaders, I'm not convinced that anything they do in public is not going to be counterproductive. Well, in public, I, I agree. Good at it. But I'm talking about in private. Part of, we all know we all have <sighs> politics. I'm to not ten percent. Conv- it's like it's an iceberg. Ten percent of what you see is what's happening above the surface. Yeah. I don't generally assume that people who flail in public turn into social Maybe maestros in private. At least try. And try. I, I think you can criticize them for not trying, but I can also understand, and I've seen institutions get into this place before, whether it's a private business or a government or even an individual who feels besieged, they become convinced that the best thing they can do is say nothing and go to ground and it will go away. And I think in this case, that's wrong. But I think okay, but that when you might have a conservative happening. opposition leader so saying he's going not... to defund the CBC, you gain, you literally have nothing to lose at that point. They've heard it before. The well, question if they is don't, whether or not they dumb. believe it this time. If they, if, if, if they don't, I they're making it. a very uh, I believe crucial it. miscalculation. And again, I ask you, why exactly are they making the executive paychecks then if they can't politically calculate that risk? I, I mean, like, that's part of their job. Like, I, I don't know what to I don't, I, I want to be really clear. I'm not giving any CBC reporter or journalist hell for not being at the CFCN conference. That was not, I, I don't expect them to advocate for themselves or for their jobs in that environment. That is not their job. That is senior executive management to be able to assess political risks and engage with stakeholders appropriately according to those political risks. If you can't fundamentally do that, why do you have a senior role in that position? What are we what what do you do here, Bob? What do you do exactly here? I, I mean, I just don't to me there's no excuse for that. Um, but and I hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there was a senior exec, CBC executive hitting up some hospitality street I didn't see. If they did, please drop me a line, Jen at readtheline.ca. I'll be happy to apologize. I just didn't yeah. see I saw environmental activists in those in those suites. I saw all kinds of people who understood very well, done the math on this, and realized that they needed to be there. At least trying to trying to build some relationships, trying to build some FaceTime. Like you know, I, I don't understand where the math was on that. Um, but I think, as I said, if I were a, an employee or an ordinary journalist at the CBC, I would I would feel as if my senior leadership had failed me in that, and I would feel that that position is justified. So. Catherine Tate deserves to be called out for that. She deserves to, to, to answer to her employees and also to the tax payer who fund her for those decisions. I, I think that's justified. Well, and I would, I'll, all I'll say in this before we ask people to like and subscribe is that if anyone at the CBC Please. does want to correct Jen about uh, that, by all means, and when you're doing it as a PS, please let me know about my yeah. inquiry into where Travis We would like to see a picture of him uh, with a newspaper with it. today's date. Thank you very much. Proof of life. Proof like, of and life. like and subscribe. Um, do we want to talk? Alberta update. We got like you know what? Like we've been talking a while, but you want to yeah, talk? Quick Alberta. wrap up, Alberta. So two up. things. One, the uh, Alberta NDP leadership race had their first uh, debate. I watched in earnest. It was very interesting to me. Um, what I took away from that debate was the absolute star of that goddamn show was a woman named uh, Jody Cal. Callahu, sorry, I'm just going to get the name right here because I'm going to mess up, mess up her middle name. I'm sorry, Jody Callahu Stonehouse. There we go, Jody Callahu Stonehouse, who I think is a First Nations individual. Mm-hmm. Who, um, hello, I've got, I've got a, I've got a, join her in here. <laughs> I thought she was fantastic. She she was by far the most polished individual on that stage. She had great, she had really good policy, really good delivery. Um, to me, my takeaway from that particular debate was she. She was doing 
what Nahed Nenshi did to win back in 2010. And that was she's far from behind, very not exactly didn't have the profile of the other candidates, but just nailing it on the debate circuit. And I, I wonder if she was actually able to pull votes over. That was really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Second thing I want to know, and as you can see, I've got a, I've got, I've got a little um, cameo thing happening. James, do you want to say hi? Hi. Thank you. You're very cute. Now go to your room. Okay, hey, but why do? But I can't wonder why. Um, we have to be quiet because it, because we have to be quiet because mommy is recording her podcast and other people are going to listen to this on YouTube. But why do I have to be quiet? Be, when, because they don't. I'm filming your podcast. Because they don't want to hear you right now. They want to hear me, even though you're very cute. Okay. Okay. So shh. shh, shh. Go go play trains. <laughs> I think we should just keep that in. Um, why do? Why does he have to be quiet when I'm doing my podcast? Uh, that's fair. Uh, that's that's legit. It's not my job to to keep to keep a man down. Um, the other thing I wanted to note is that there's a lot of stuff coming out of the UCP now that are, to my mind, uh, really over the line crazy shit. One is uh, Bill 20, which they just announced. Again, I'm teasing this because we have a column coming out about it next week, so keep an eye on this on the line. But uh, one of the things that are there's a couple things that are being proposed for what this this bill, which I think are, I think would be would be fairly surprising in any kind of national context for a provincial government to be trying to do. One is that they're trying to take a, a considerable amount of power over the municipal city, the municipal councils. They want to um, give themselves the power to file, fire people from city council. They want to give themselves the power to overturn bylaws. Um, and they want to also, of course, give themselves the power to sort of overturn municipal health orders. couple of the points. One is that for a government and a conservative movement that has traditionally believed that, that power best resides in the most local government, most local level of government possible to see this government engage in the centralization of power in the pro- pro- provincial government. I think that is uh, highly improper and inappropriate. Secondly, I mean, take f- the ability to fire council members. I have no problem with the provincial government giving citizens the ability to engage in recall legislation. I mean, we've seen an example of that in Calgary of late, but that power shouldn't reside in the provincial government. That power really properly resides with with the voters who elected those those councils as representatives. Um, the power to overturn bylaws. The last thing I want is a provincial government that is, say, for example, getting uh, donations from developers to have the ability to overturn bylaws or have the ability to direct the city to engage in land use decisions. That's inappropriate centralization of power. To And the ability to overturn health orders. I mean, we all know who that's playing to. Come on, the fuck now. Um, you might be able to make a slight case for that for me, but it's not a strong one. Um, and then this goes on top of other stuff that the, the provincial government is trying to do is that, for example, they're trying to take control over the way that the federal government, federal grants and federal money is, is distributed across the provinces. And I can understand some of what they're doing. Like I understand that, uh, for example, they don't want to have a system where you can have a federal liberal liberal government throwing a hundred million dollars into, say, you know, solar powered bus stops in George Cajal's writing. Like I can understand why they would want to cut off federal pork barrel money, essentially, um, and take a little bit more control of that. You might be able to make a case for that. Where you lose me is where we have the federal government trying to take control over things like shirt grants, which are grants that the federal government gives for particular types of research within universities. No, there's no, there's no, there's no need for that. The federal government granting organization isn't a corrupt enterprise. Like that's that's just silly. Um, and the only reason for the provincial government for for to even want to involve itself in that kind of thing is because they have a pretty overt ideological agenda and they want to control and have more control over the types of research that's coming out of the, the post secondary education institutions, which. I don't think that's appropriate. Um, if you, if the government wants to fund particular kinds of research, it can do that out of its own coffers, and it can control that by all means. But to try and try and circumvent the federal granting organization, and and by the way, a federal granting organization, which on the whole has actually a very good reputation, that doesn't seem appropriate to me. So um, I think that we're going to have a column coming out about some of that stuff. To me, it's a very, very um, 
how should I say this, hypocritical set of moves coming from a group of people who would once consider themselves fairly libertarian-ish conservatives. And to me, it's it's also an inappropriate centralization of power in the federal and the provincial government. And I think it it ought to be rightly criticized. Mm-hmm. When I was in Calgary, I had joked with you, well, it was half a joke, that I, if you were going to give me too rough a ride about being the Laurentian from the center of the universe, I had a whole <laughs> lot of retaliatory lines ready to go. And I only needed one or two of them. Um, but there is something I have said about Albertans before to you and to other Albertans through you. And I'm going to repeat it here. No. You're not particularly conservative. Yeah. You just got cowboy hats. Yeah. You're conservative in name, not this, in action. This, this is extremely nothing, there's nothing conservative conservative about this. legislation because there's two big failures here. A basic conservative principle is that democratic accountability should rest as closely as possible yes. to the electorate. Any provincial attempt to unseat a municipal candidate 100%. is a complete perversion of that. It is just a fundamental failure to understand and respect the actual conservative Mm -hmm. view on democratic accountability. And furthermore, if a federal government wishes to use its tax revenues to support local initiatives through commercial contracts or municipal development deals, and another level of government tries to intersperse itself or interpose itself between that, I, as a member of the public or as the owner of a business or as a local elected official, have the right to petition my federal government support for yeah, support that's right. and for business. And the idea, and then the idea that another, and it, and it could be yeah. business, right? It could be a contract. Like I want to provide federal services mm-hmm. to the duly elected government of Canada, or it could be, I'm a, I'm a local politician and I yeah. want those solar powered bus stops. And there's a federal program that may provide them and I want to get access to them. The idea that another level of government is going to stick itself between them is, again, once again, profoundly The other thing, too, is it exacerbates something that the provincial government complains about a lot, which is the uh, equalization imbalance. So this is the idea that uh, Albertans are paying more in taxes than it gets back in services. Okay, well, well, how do you think that balance is going to be further affected when you're adding layers of bureaucracy toward the getting back side of that equation? Right? Like, it's I, 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 that doesn't fix anything. And I think to me, it really um, puts forward a concern that essentially you have a government that is not only stealing itself up against federal, federal overreach, but is at the same time sort of trying to invoke some kind of quasi sovereignty while becoming more authoritarian itself. Or not authoritarian, I think is probably too strong a word, but while it's becoming more centralized and, and less accountable in its own dealings. Right, like if you if you want if you if you want to make an argument yeah. that Alberta yeah. deserves the same level of sovereignty that Quebec does, which I mean Quebec's charted a path there, that's fine. But then the 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 counterweight to that argument is that you, as a provincial government, need to demonstrate better governance, better self control, better restraint than what you perceive to be an out of control or corrupt federal government. Are we seeing that with these kinds of bills, behaviors, and laws? I'm saying. No, it undermines your argument for a more sovereign and free Alberta to behave in this way. Interference in federal contracts and municipal right? elections brought yeah, your to you conservative by your government. conservative government in the most conservative Not, come on province now. in the country. Come on now, guys. Anyway, I mean, we'll see how... Enjoy the cowboy hats. Yeah, well, like like hats. I said, I'm, I'm like and subscribe, except let's be honest here. This is not going to be our top liker. So we managed to piss off all the people who normally like us this week. But that's our. Yeah, we've identified our key constituent groups and we have individually invited every last oh, we, we, we do love you, though. Thank you very much for um, listening to us. Mm. That's about it. That's it. Like and subscribe the line or I mean, in fact, please like and subscribe the line to make up for the unlikes, the downlikes that we are going to be dealing with. uh, The tsunami of downlikes that we're going to be dealing with between Alex Jones fans, Daniel Smith fans, conservatives, uh, Diagonal. Oh, it's going to be just a joy. So please save us, save us from ourselves. Do do for us what the politician handlers won't do for that. Do for their own bosses. Like and subscribe to the line. Like and subscribe. Bye. Have a good weekend, everybody. Talk to you soon.